you're cruising a dark road, tired and ready to hit the hay. Suddenly, something leaps from the nearby brush right into the center of the road. You stomp on the brakes and you rub your eyes. Some mangy looking dog is just standing there facing away from you. But annoyance turns into terror as this dog stands up. It's taller than you and each of its limbs is bent all wrong. Then you hear the footsteps right by your window. There are two of them. Welcome back to Unexplained Encounters. I'm your host, Darkness Prevails, and you can follow me on Twitter at Dark Prevails for updates on my trading card game, Cryptid. Today I've got some very scary and allegedly true night drive stories that'll make you sell your car. Enjoy, and remember to send me your scary trucker stories soon at darkstories.org so I can narrate them. Also check out eeriecast.com for more free and creepy podcasts like this. Now, let's begin. The Ghost Car from Caddy Vengeance I had a good sit down with my mom to reminisce about some of the odd happenings in our lives. One in particular kind of stuck out. Back in the day, my sister was in marching band all four years of her high school career. Usually, I tagged along when my parents, well, usually just my mom, drove her to football games and competitions. That usually meant my mom was stopping off at the Exxon before heading on home afterward. And a stop at the Exxon usually meant I could talk my way into a cookies and cream candy bar, a favorite treat of mine back then. It was later in the fall around this time, and as usual, I went along with my mom to drop my sister off at a game. I think my sister was staying at a friend's afterward that night, or with my grandmother, because we didn't stay to watch. Instead, we turned around and headed home. Our home was pretty isolated, about 40 minutes away from the high school, give or take. So by the time we were in sight of the Kenna Exxon, it was dark out. For those of you who don't know, Kenna is a tiny, tiny city in Jackson County, West Virginia, with not much more than a post office, the Exxon, the elementary school, and a restaurant. This time, instead of turning into the Exxon, my mom, however, turned left, down a road which I think was named Kentucky Road. There was some disagreement on this when we retold the story, but bear with me. I'm remembering the details as best I can. I gave my mom a disappointed look, but realized she was staring nervously through the rearview mirror. The road was mostly downhill at the start, passing that restaurant I mentioned before. I think it was named Patty's Country Cookin'. I suddenly then realized there were headlights riding very close to our bumper. My mother is a nervous driver. She's been in a few accidents in the past, and she doesn't like it when people ride too close to her. So she glanced at me and said, I'm gonna just pull over and let this guy pass whenever we get to a wide spot. I remember nodding in agreement because while I couldn't make out any details of the car behind us, even I could recognize they were uncomfortably close to us. So we make it to the bottom of the road. My mom pulls into this big, gravelly, wide spot that's on the left of the road. And nothing. No headlights pass us. They just vanished into thin air. The two of us sat there for probably five minutes, just staring. Finally, my mom looked at me and asked, uh, you, you saw a car, right? To which I nodded, and I even said, yeah, mom, I, I did. At that point, I had goosebumps all over. Did you see them pass us? She asked, still staring at the road. Nah, I didn't. We sat there a little longer, searching the road together. There isn't anywhere the car could have pulled off behind us. The road was just a straight stretch at the bottom of the hill. We would have seen their headlights pass us by. We would have seen their taillights too. 
It looked like a big car, given the height difference of the headlights that had been riding the bumper of my mom's 2003 or 2004 Buick LeSabre. So if it had gone over that hill, we definitely would have heard something. So yeah, I'm pretty sure my mom and I encountered a ghost car that night. In addition to that one encounter, my mother informed me that she had had similar experiences like that numerous times on that very same road whenever she was driving alone. Sometimes the car would be riding her bumper and vanish if she pulled over, like when I was with her, and other times she would be followed by a pair of taillights just to watch them disappear right in front of her eyes. My dad confirmed that he had also had a couple of experiences like this. They aren't the most harrowing experiences, but it was very frightening at the time, and to have seen it firsthand, well, it definitely shook me up a bit. Strange things happening on my block. From slightly off. I have seen some strange stuff on my block. Of course, there are reasonable explanations for all of it, but I figured I could share some of them. These are a couple of small stories. The first happened six or seven days ago. It was 8 or 9 p.m., and I was riding my bike around. I know it's strange to ride your bike so late, but I don't like riding near people, and the neighbors or their kids are almost always out during the day. So nighttime is perfect for me. Not to mention I'm a night owl. The road that is in front of my house goes down to the next block, then it ends and you can see a field. The rest of my block is unimportant to the stories. I stopped in front of my driveway, and I was looking on down the road. That's when, I swear to God, I saw something dart across the road very fast. It was two or three feet tall, and it was a darker color than the shadows. I was absolutely sure it was running on two legs. It looked as if it was wearing a cloak, now, remember, I was looking at it head on. It was not a out of the corner of my eye kind of thing. Also, I do scare somewhat easily. I was going to ride the bike around the block again, but at that point, I was too terrified to do so. I walked my bike to the garage and went back inside. These other stories happened recently. Me, my father, and my little brother, who we'll call L had gotten back from a late night drive around the countryside. The boys were in the garage opening boxes, and I was walking around in the middle of the road. I was doing that because moving around really helped me get creative, and I wanted to get some writing ideas. At that point, my father had gone inside, but my younger brother was still outside with me. I looked up then and saw something in the sky. It looked like airplane lights, but I could see almost a round outline around it, and I noticed there was another one. Suddenly a loud, growling, gurgling-like noise scared the living daylights out of me. Then, my cat, Silverbells, was running like a bat out of heck towards me. I told my brother to get my dad, because I figured my dad would know what was going on. He came back outside with my mother. We looked at the object, and it was just hovering in place, I told them about what I saw and the noise. My mom seemed very unconcerned about the lights and was more concerned about the figure and noise, which apparently thoroughly creeped her out. We went back inside together and that's the last of it. If I see anything else crazy, I'll let you know. Skinwalker in Santa Cruz From That Person I'm a female, and this was in 2017. I was still in high school at the time as a senior. My favorite things back then were hiking and photography. Oh, and camping. I loved camping. I would go out camping every chance I got. I would especially love going camping with my two best friends, Sarah and Sally. One day in the winter season, we decided to go on a trip to Santa Cruz. We realized it was a very big tourist attraction so we decided to camp out in the mountains. 
it was a three-day camping trip, altogether about a four-hour drive from where we live. We gathered our things and headed off. It was just us on the road singing along to songs with snacks and all that. Honestly, I think we got a little too distracted because we were on a road going through a very small town. This place was almost like a ghost town. It was pitch black, but we had to go through to get to the main road to the campgrounds. At the time, it was so dark, and we knew there might be deer, but we didn't expect to see any in the middle of this ghost town. Lo and behold, we spotted a deer right in the middle of the darkness. Its eyes seemed lifeless, and it just stood right in the middle of the road. Slowly, we passed by it. It seemed to just follow us with its eyes. Then, eventually, it just walked away. This kind of creeped all of us out. We knew that deer usually ran away from threats, especially vehicles on the road. But this one didn't seem to care, and even walked away slowly. We said nothing about it to each other at the moment. I felt like I wasn't the only one who felt as if they had a boulder in the pit of their stomach. And I could tell you now, it was not road sickness. We got there at about 9 p.m., which was way too late. We'd fallen way behind due to overpacking. When we got there, Sarah, who was driving, parked the car. We sat there for a minute. They seemed scared, like they had a second thought about our trip, maybe thinking about going home. Suddenly, Sally said, Well, it's dark. Shouldn't we wait until it's light out to set up? Maybe we should just sleep here for tonight. We decided that was a good and smart idea. We pulled out some blankets from our bags, and we settled down in the car. We talked for about two hours, and one by one we fell asleep. I think we only slept about three hours. I awoke to a scurrying sound. It was coming from right outside the car. I picked up my phone, and I looked at the time. It was 1 a.m., I was confused and tired. Suddenly, I heard it again. I was going to brush it off as deer, and I laid my head back down. But suddenly, I heard tapping on the window behind me. I then saw that Sarah was looking behind me, not saying anything. Frozen in terror, I slowly turned and looked up. There it was, that deer. The deer we'd passed earlier on that dark road. It had dark, pit-like eyes. So dark it seemed like its eyes had been cut out. It almost looked dead, but it was alive somehow. Its body was so altered and messed up, it looked like it got hit by a truck and just got back up like it was nothing. It was so unnatural. It began to hit its antlers against the side of the car. Then I watched as it stood on two legs and began to scream. That was a noise unlike anything I'd ever heard. We all screamed back. Sarah and I forgot that Sally was in the back, but we were all seeing it. Sarah had a tendency to freeze up. I had to shake her to snap her out of it. She finally came to and responded, quickly turning on the car and immediately putting it into drive. That monster deer thing quickly followed us, but Sarah stepped on the gas. Before we knew it, we were pushing 80 miles per hour. Before long, its roaring and screaming behind us became distant, though that chase felt as if it went on forever. Soon we reached that little town, and we looked behind us, not seeing anything out of the ordinary anymore. Despite that, we took no chances and just kept driving for about two more hours, and we didn't stop until the sun began to rise. We got to a hotel. We decided to stay indoors that weekend. We haven't gone camping since then, and I'm not sure if we ever will. To this day, Sarah still calls me when she has nightmares about the thing, and I'm not too far behind her. 
True Iowa Wendigo Encounter from Anonymous. This is a true encounter. The story takes place when I was a junior in high school. I grew up in a small town in northwest Iowa. I'll leave the name of the town out of the story, but it was built in the mid to late 1800s in a valley. Unknown to me until a few months later, this valley was sacred to the Sioux Indians who lived here before the settlers came. With this new information, I was able to finally tie up my experience, finally giving it closure. Now, I was an idiot my sophomore summer, just before my junior year. I got into drinking and got really close to my small group of friends. Sadly, that summer ended and we began school again. I would run cross country, so I'm very familiar with all the roads and trails in and near town. One night, my friend and I, I'll call my friend D for the story, were at a volleyball game. We decided that we would leave early to go rip a few darts like normal idiotic teenagers. I didn't like cigarettes, but I knew he did, and he didn't like to smoke alone, so I went with him to keep him company. We figured we'd just go to the cemetery to smoke that night. It was quiet there, and very secluded from the rest of town. Now, I was employed by that cemetery over the summer to mow and trim the gravestones, so I'm quite familiar with it. I find it very beautiful in the summer, because it has rolling hills and a unique shape. We drove over to Dee's house to get the cigarettes, then we drove over to the cemetery so we didn't get caught. We parked right in front of the mower shed, which was on the north side of the cemetery. This cemetery has the shape of a rectangle. It's about half a mile long and an eighth mile wide. Every about 200 feet or so, a new section begins. The cemetery faced east to west the long way. Gravel roads separated the sections. The back part, which was also the older part, has more trees, and the only side of it that doesn't have a forest across from it is the east side, where the road is. Otherwise, the whole cemetery is just in the middle of the woods. We climbed out of the jeep and began to just walk around the gravel roads with only our phone flashlights. It was around 9 p.m. and pitch black otherwise. We would actually run these gravel roads for cross-country practice sometimes, so the two of us were quite familiar with where we were. We started smoking as we walked around, just talking about our futures and other things like that. It was actually a heartfelt moment. That is, until Dee noticed he dropped the pack of cigarettes. So we doubled back to look for them, but we couldn't find them on the gravel path. Now, this is when it happens. I know this sounds corny and cliche, but it's the honest truth. As we were searching for the cigarettes, Dee noticed something in the woods. We were on the north side, the oldest side closest to the woods. He told me that he saw something glowing in the dark. He said they looked like yellow dots. I looked all over the same place he was looking, but I didn't see them. Being foolish, we walked into the section to get closer to the woods to find out what it was. We got about halfway from the woods to the gravel path, and that's when I began to hear the faint sound of a voice. I asked D if he heard it, and he said no, keeping his gaze fixed on the supposed yellow dots. I couldn't make out what that voice was saying. At that point, I'm freaked out, but D really wanted to know what it was, so we did press on a little farther. As we did, the voice got louder. I still wasn't able to make out what it was saying, though. However, now, D was beginning to hear it too. I said to him, You hear that? The voice sounded familiar to me now. It sounded like my little brother. D responded to me, saying, It sounds like my mom's voice. My heart sank into my chest. It suddenly felt very hard to breathe. I told D what it sounded like. It looked like his face went white. He began to breathe fast and heavy. We both look back into the woods, and now 
I too was beginning to see those glowing yellow dots. But only for a moment. They seemed to vanish without a trace right then. We looked at each other and decided without speaking a word to go a few more steps. Just as we took our first step, the sound of something moving very fast and heavily behind us forced us to turn around. But we found nothing. We glance at each other once more and book it back to Dee's jeep. Luckily, we weren't very far from the jeep. We jumped in, and he threw it into drive. The two of us sped out of there without looking back. I drove us back to the school so I could get my car. We didn't say a word, and I just got out and went home. The following day at school, we met before our class started. We talked about what the heck happened last night. Neither of us knew and we decided we just wouldn't talk about it again. I soon resigned from that summer job and gave it to a younger kid. This happened about two years ago now, and recently I learned what a Wendigo was. They are creatures in Native American legend who look like human-deer hybrids, or maybe that's just a modern interpretation. They're said to be able to move at freakishly fast speed and can mimic the voice of loved ones to draw you in close. Apparently, they roamed Native American land. When I read that, my experience came back to me, and it all made sense. The only part of the Wendigo we saw were what we believed to be its yellow eyes. So yeah, I do believe what we encountered that night was a Wendigo. The scariest part is I found this out just before Christmas break, and when I returned home, Dee and I went back out to the cemetery to confirm our suspicions. What we found scared me so much, I never wanted to go back. We got out of my car, walking the same path. Only just a few minutes into the walk, we found the same pack of cigarettes Dee had dropped, lying in the snow. The Great Uber Houdini From Kingmaster88 I knew there was a lot of crazy people out there in the world, but I didn't know just how many crazies there were. A little backstory, I'm a guy in my mid-30s. I'm an Uber driver, and I've been driving for them for about three years now. For the most part, the passengers have been quite normal and mundane. But let me tell you about this one passenger I had one night. It was about a year and a half ago, and I can still remember it like it just happened. This one night, it had been snowing for about six hours straight. I decided I could take one more passenger, and it was about midnight. That's when I got the request to pick up my next passenger. So when I arrived at this person's pickup spot, I confirmed where he was going to. I almost got halfway to his destination. The route the GPS was taking me through had four lanes, two going one way and two going the other. I was in the fast lane, going about 40 miles an hour tops. After all, it had been snowing for about six hours at this point. That's when my car started to scream and beep at me. When I looked to see why, there on the dashboard of the car, it was telling me that the door to where this guy was sitting was opened. So I looked over my shoulder real quick, and before I could say a word, like, hey, the door's open, could you shut it please? Without warning, I basically saw this in slow motion. The guy opened the door all the way up, jumped out of my car while it was going about 40 miles per hour, and hit the ground, beginning to slide. When I saw this happen, I slammed on my brakes and came to a complete stop. The guy was lucky there were no other cars out at this time of night. But when my car finally came to a stop, I turned around in my seat to see where this guy was at. I saw him quickly get back up to his feet and take off running like a madman, as if the fall had never fazed him. When he took off running, that back door he just jumped out of was still open, so I got out, went around, and closed the door. When I got back into the driver's seat, I drove in the direction I last saw him running, just in case he needed some medical assistance or something. I got over to where I last saw him, and... Poof, he disappeared into the night. When I couldn't find the guy, 
I just called up Uber to file a report with them. And they told me they put this incident on their file, flagging that specific passenger. Since then, or even before that, I've never had any kind of fares that came even remotely close to this one. Spooky Experience with a Client From It's Scary Every Time Before my current job, I was a driver for transportation services that took people to and from doctor's appointments and the like, so I'd always get my share of interesting people. One of them, whose name I'll keep to myself, was a really cool guy. The very first time I met him, he admitted right away that he was schizophrenic, but he knew enough of what he saw to where he could differentiate between what normal people see and what I see. Like I said, a very cool guy. I got the opportunity to drive him several times. We would talk about books, movies, etc. When I put in my two weeks notice to come to my current job, I got to drive him one last time. I remember telling him it was my last time I'd get to talk with him. We were both a bit sad. We shook hands and made our way to our destination. Right when we got there, he said to me, Do you mind if I tell you what I see right now? I was always curious because he would always point out things while we drove, but he would never say exactly what he was pointing out. This was around Thanksgiving. So every time the holiday comes around, I remember what he told me. He described it as people dancing, but the more he explained, the more traumatic it got. He said he saw shadows of people twirling and spinning like ballet, but their heads would just come off and ribbons would burst out of them and get tangled with other dancers. He also mentioned big, sometimes building-sized shadows stepping on these dancers as they moved, jumping and playing like dogs. He describes these images for about five minutes before he has to get out of the van and onto his appointment. I stayed professional, leaving my horrified expression locked behind a smile. He jumped out of the van, spun on the spot, and said, Hey, good luck with your and he completely froze, his expression wide-eyed and fixed on something that was apparently right outside my driver's side window. Then he snapped out of it a few seconds later. Uh, new job, he finished, before closing the door and walking into the building. I have to admit, I turned around and looked out my window. There was nothing there, just a couple of trees in the parking lot, I was very alone. I got the impression that whatever he saw was huge and right behind me. But whatever it truly was, I'll never know. And I honestly think I'm okay with that. A Ride Through the Woods From Anonymous This happened years ago. I was in high school, and I was part of our school's winter drumline. After one of our practices, a few of us hung out for a while and discussed creepy and scary things. One of my friends, we'll call him B, told us of an abandoned neighborhood not too far from us. We'd all planned on going after one of our competitions. There were five of us, myself and B, and our other friends, J, G, and M. B drove his car with G, and I was in the back seat of J's car with M in the passenger seat. We followed B into the nearby woods and onto the streets of the abandoned neighborhood. It was creepy. The houses were broken down and the streetlights didn't work. The only way we could really see was thanks to our flashlights and headlights. We drove up to an abandoned playground and stopped. B, G, and M refused to get out of the cars. J and I, however, decided to go. We both exited the vehicle and the whole area was eerily quiet. Jay and I pulled out our pocket knives, which were the only weapons we had. This playground was as run down as the rest of the place. We walked towards it. There was a jungle gym with a slide and a sketchy-looking swing set. Beyond the playground was the woods. 
we heard movement inside those woods and decided to nope the heck out of there. We ran back to the car and followed B once more. We called B and put it on speaker so we could all talk, and B did the same. The whole neighborhood was creepy, and we didn't feel like leaving the safety of our cars, and I'm glad we didn't. After a bit, B over the phone said, What the heck? We came to a stop, and I looked over the seats. Some guy had walked up to B's car. I couldn't make out what he looked like, but we were overhearing a conversation through the phone. The man was saying that his car was stuck in the mud from the rain from the previous day. We could see the taillights of the car a bit away. We could even hear some woman cackling in the distance. The man's story sounded genuine. The problem was, there was no rain in the area yesterday, or at all this week for that matter. B was trying to talk to the man when I happened to glance at the house to our right. I saw several people sneaking out of the place. I spoke up. Oh crap, drive! That's all anyone needed to hear. We floored it out of there. I turned back and saw about 20 people running out of the houses right towards us. The car that was supposedly stuck in the mud floored it out of the mud as well to chase after us. We flew through the neighborhood, and eventually, we made it out. The car chasing us stopped before coming out of the neighborhood. We caught our breaths at a stake and shake and talked over what happened. We vowed to never return to that neighborhood, and we called the cops. We never did learn about what happened, and I hope those people never took any lives. Possession of Mo From Dell 6511 I've always believed in a higher power, and to some I understand that's a sensitive subject. But no matter what anyone believes, I think if you believe in good, you really have to believe in evil as well. You can't just have one without the other. So with that in mind, I'd like to tell you about two encounters that made me a believer in evil spirits. I used to have this friend. We'll call him Mo for privacy's sake. Mo and I grew up together, and we were as close as brothers for many years. As we got older, we went our separate ways, but that's another story. Anyway, he and I used to do everything together, and he even lived with me a couple of times. Mo had a rough upbringing, so my dad really felt the need to help him out, and I was happy because I wasn't alone anymore. I was an only child for a military mechanic and a waitress, so I would spend a lot of time at home by myself. We had a mutual friend who was a youth pastor that we went to school with. He was young for that job title, but he was very charismatic, and we enjoyed the church he was at. So Mo and I decided to start going there. One summer, we were having a revival with a preacher who was doing sermons about something he called spiritual warfare. Mo and I were a little bit skeptical, as we had never really thought much about demons or evil spirits. We left the church one night, making our way back home, which was about a 45-minute drive through the woods and farmlands of southern Georgia. I noticed at some point, Mo got really quiet. This wasn't like him at all. He just kept staring out the window into the woods, which we were driving through. Hey, what in the world are you doing, bro? I finally asked. No reply. Hey, are you okay? I asked, this time with a little more bass in my voice to get his attention. Still, nothing. So then I tapped his shoulder. He didn't move and he didn't speak. This continued on for about 15 minutes. Finally, out of nowhere, he asked, Can you see it? Uh, see what? He then pointed out the window. I hadn't been paying attention before, but now it was all too clear. What we were seeing defied all logic. There was definitely something running in the woods beside us. 
It was keeping pace with our car, and the car was going at least 60 miles per hour. The thing, whatever it was, was just inside the tree line, running straight through the trees, across bridges, and sometimes through nothing but thin air. This thing had the shape of a human, but its head was in the shape of an upside down triangle. It was black, blacker than the night around it, with orange and yellow running through its body, almost like veins. It had long black hair, glowing yellow eyes, and horns that curved back in towards the eyes. But the worst part was the razor sharp teeth. They were jagged and appeared to be covered in blood. I had never seen anything like it. Not before, not since. And I hope I never do again. I floored the gas pedal on my 80s model Chrysler New Yorker, hitting 80, trying to just outrun this thing. But suddenly, it was gone. Before I could let out a sigh of relief, something hit the top of the car. Not hard like something large but more like an acorn or something just fell on it. Right after that, I saw this black hand with claws come sliding down the top of my windshield where my rear view mirror was. Instantly, I slammed on the brakes and that hand disappeared. But we didn't see anything fall off the car. Until this point, Mo had been silent. Suddenly, he just screamed, Get us out of here! We drove away as quickly as we possibly could. We didn't see anything else on the way home, and we didn't stop again until we arrived back at my house. We were silent the whole way there. Only after we got ready for bed did Mo finally want to talk about what we saw. We discussed it for hours, wondering if the church service had anything to do with what we'd seen. We tried to talk to a couple of people about it, but they were very skeptical, so we just stopped bringing it up. We didn't want to be called liars or be ridiculed, but we knew what we saw, and it definitely wasn't natural. Fast forward years later, and I had moved up to North Georgia. My mother and father had split up, and I moved in with my dad. Eventually, Mo was looking for a change, and he asked if he could stay with us for a bit. I was more than happy to have him back around. I'd started dating a girl whose uncle was a pastor for a small church, and I taught Sunday school there. Mo wanted to give the church I was at a try, and he fit in perfect with all of us. Once again, everything just seemed right with the world, or so I thought. After Mo moved in, Things at my house got a little weird. We would hear footsteps in the living room outside my bedroom door, and we would see flashes of light, like a shadow walking past a lamp on the floor. We would check, but no one would be there. We just chalked it up to being in an old house with creaking wood floors. After church one Sunday night, we went back home to get some rest and to get ready for work the next day. I was laying out my uniform when Mo walked into my room with a weird look on his face. He almost looked like he was in pain. Call the pastor now. I feel like I'm going to die. This can't wait. I was caught off guard. He had seemed fine not five minutes earlier, but now he didn't look like the same person. His eyes were black. His face looked almost sunk in like a corpse, and his skin looked almost yellow. I asked him if he needed to go to the hospital or something, but he screamed back, No, it's not medical. He won't leave me alone. Uh, who? I asked, in almost a low growl, in a voice that was not his. He just looked at me and said, You know who? I called the pastor, who told me to meet him at the church immediately. We flew back to the church, arriving at almost the same time as the pastor. Get inside, quick, the pastor said, as we helped my almost unconscious friend into the building. We set him up on a pew, and we started to pray for him. 
The pastor prayed for deliverance from this spirit, and Mo started getting nauseous. He even threw up a couple of times. All of a sudden, I felt what can only be described as a hurricane force wind blowing past me towards the front door. Then, Mo seemed to regain control of himself as his color and eyes went back to normal. The pastor said that he had felt the spirit earlier, but it was unclear to him where it was coming from, that he had felt something messing with him, trying to discourage him during the services that day. As we talked about this, and we walked outside, across the street there were cop cars. When the cops saw us outside, they came over and they asked us if we had seen anyone near the building, because apparently an alarm had been tripped and they were sent to investigate. We just looked at each other in shock. Could this spirit have done that as it fled the church? Everything went back to normal after that. Mo found a job and got his own place, and I moved after my father passed away and began building a new life. I often think about those nights with Mo and wonder what he's up to these days. I hope nothing like that ever came after him again. I'm still interested in the paranormal, and I'm definitely conscious of the fact that there are some things that inhabit this world which do not want what's best for you. I saw a werewolf twice. From Swiss Dog These events happened seven years apart. My first encounter happened when I was 11 years old. It was 2013. I'd ask my dad if I could spend time at my friend John's house. He said, sure, just be back by 9pm, okay? And take Ruppy and Clark with you. Ruppy was my four-year-old Rottweiler, and Clark was my one-year-old standard poodle. I had another dog, Keys, a six-year-old bulldog, but he stayed at the house to keep dad company. Later on that night, it was getting close to 9 p.m., so I started to walk back home. I lived in the country at the time. There were a lot of wild animals around. As the dogs and I were walking, I began to hear noises, but I was thinking it was just a raccoon. We were about six feet away from my driveway when Ruppy stopped and started to growl. I thought he was just growling at another animal, but when Clark started to growl too, I knew it was something worse than that. Something was wrong. You see, Clark never really growled at anything. I was getting ready to say something when a large, dark creature ran out from behind a tree and took off running. I stood there, startled, dumbfounded. From what I saw, I remember thinking right there, that couldn't be real, right? My dogs and I then ran and ran until we made it back home to the front door. We burst through, and Dad said, What in the world? Before he slammed the door and grabbed his gun. My dad looked at me and said, Stay inside. There's something out there. Fast forward to 2020. I was 18. Clark and Keys were gone by then. My dad and I were driving back home from the lake one night with our dogs, Zack, a Border Collie, Lucky, a Doberman Pinscher, and Loki, a Black Wolf Malamute mix. As we drove, everything was really quiet. Suddenly, I saw something dart across the road. I quickly yelled, Dad, look out! He slammed on his brakes and said, Another one? I looked at him and I told him, we have to get home. I looked back at our dogs. They were growling and baring their teeth. We made it home fast and slept in the living room. Nowadays, my dad and I avoid walking or driving at night whenever possible. Road Trip from Hell From Odd Bolio. When I was 20 years old, I was driving from New York to my home in Florida. I stayed overnight at my grandparents' house in Virginia. After hitting the road from Virginia, I hit some dense interstate road where I was traveling in inner city interstate roads. 
I was in the left lane, with a semi in the right lane right by me, and a five-gallon paint bucket lid was rolling vertically at my car. The semi on the right did not let me over, so the only thing I could do was yell some swears and hit the lid straight on with my little Toyota Yaris. After that little incident, I was stressed about the drive, though it's not like I haven't done it eight or nine times by that point. I also had my small hound dog with me, Lucy. We kept on driving, and when we reached the Georgia line, I stopped and got some gas, letting Lucy out to do some business. When we got back on the interstate, maybe 20 miles afterwards, I noticed someone was following us. They drove in a white van with a handmade barricade from the driver and passenger seat to the back of the van. The windows were painted white in the back, so you couldn't see what was inside in the back. There was an old man driving the thing with a permanent scowl on his face, and he wore those old 1970s Chester molester glasses on his face. He was so close to my car on the interstate at times, I couldn't even see his headlights. He stayed so close to my vehicle the entire time, I tried to speed up. I drove along the Georgia interstate, going 100 miles per hour to try to evade this guy. I was weaving through traffic, and no matter what I did, he stayed right by me with his face scowling and serious. For some reason, he just had to stay as close to me as possible. Now, Lucy was not an intimidating dog whatsoever, being a 30-pound dwarf tree-walking hound lab mix, so I don't think her presence was having much effect on this guy. I've never been so terrified while driving, and I was looking for any cops on the road to pull over to and to explain my story to. But there were no cops, and this madman stayed on my tail the entire time. That's when I decided, because I just gassed up my car, that I would simply outrun him. He would have to get gas way before I did. It was 182 miles of him following me, tailing me, so I couldn't see his headlights, or being just at the side of my car. From the state of Georgia to well past the Florida-Georgia line, he followed me. 182 miles total, and finally he was running out of gas. I'm so thankful my little car and one tank of gas got me 350 miles. I could not have imagined what would have happened if I had to stop for gas first. I wonder what he was trying to hide. I wonder what he saw that made him harass me. I-95 can be scary. I've done this trip many times and I've never, until now, had anything like that happen to me. Now I pack my Springfield Hellcat whenever I drive. The gut-wrenching feeling I had with that old man and his homemade rigged-up van driving behind me for so long was too much. I hope no one else has to deal with that sense of dread driving on the road. And if you do, I hope you're armed. I hope your dog is more intimidating, and I hope your car can outrun them. Hangman's Bridge From Lazy There is a bridge in Missouri close to Kansas City, which we call Hangman's Bridge. A few of my friends and I went there one night a year ago. I'd seen it once or twice in the daytime, and I always got chills from it then. But that night, my friends and I were looking for places to take photos of. Well, when driving up to it, you pass under a train bridge first, and when we passed through there, we thought we saw someone. But when we looked around, there was no one there. We just passed this off as a figment of our imaginations. Maybe we were looking for things. I mean, we were hoping to see some ghosts and whatnot. About three minutes later, we pull up to the hangman's bridge and we get out. We started to walk around. As we got under the bridge, I felt like someone was watching me, and so did my friends. They were taking photos, and I just kept getting this feeling that I needed to look up. So I did, but I didn't see anything out of the ordinary. I shrugged this off as my imagination again, until out of nowhere, 
a rock was thrown at me from underneath the bridge. One thing to note is that there are metal bars under the bridge that are super thin. There's no way anyone could be up there, and there was no car driving on the bridge. After the first rock was thrown, a few more flew in, hitting me in the leg and arm. I looked over at my friends. They were also being peppered by rocks. We quickly ran back to the van and got inside. We made a U-turn on the road, so we would have to drive under it. As we drove under the bridge, I kid you not, the van just died and it wouldn't start. At this point, we were freaking out and terrified. We started to hear these thumping sounds and we saw rocks being thrown at the van. But we couldn't find who was doing it. We didn't see anyone outside. Just then, it felt as if someone was shaking the van and we started to tremble ourselves. This went on for about 10 minutes. Then finally, we were able to start the van and we drove away as fast as possible, no doubt breaking the speed limit. We drove back out to my place and just sat outside for a while, too freaked out to move. A few days later, I looked up Hangman's Bridge and I found out that it was used back in the 1800s as a dumping ground for bodies. Now I knew about the name but not the story, and apparently there was a man hung there, but I couldn't find the reason why. Apparently, the noose hung there for a very long time, and apparently some very foolish person cut it down as a souvenir and took it home. I wonder how haunted that noose might be. This was one of the craziest things that happened to me, and one of many stories I have to tell. If you're ever in Kansas City, and someone asks if you want to visit Hangman's Bridge, I'd say at least don't do it at night. They Saw Something in the Tree From T.J. Sowers When my dad was about 17 years old and his friend was looking through a scope out of his window, he turned the scope towards an old oak tree. And bizarrely enough, he saw two ladies in the tree. He said one was an old witchy looking woman and the other was a beautiful young woman who looked more like a princess and the tree itself was full of snakes, spiders, and scorpions. They ran over to the tree to try to talk to these ladies. The younger lady just looked down at my dad and his friend like she wanted to talk to them but couldn't. After trying to get their attention, they eventually gave up and went inside. They went to sleep, and the next morning they woke up and looked out the window again. They saw this giant spider jump out of the tree. Once again they left, going towards the tree, this time on a mission to see the spider to see if they could kill it. They even grabbed some weapons. My dad grabbed a 12-gauge, and his friend grabbed a shovel. They ran over to the neighbor's yard to go kill it. As soon as they got there, the spider stopped moving, and before their eyes, it turned into a rock with legs that were now sticks. The neighbor ran out and said to get out of his yard. My dad told me and my sister about it, and we wanted to go drive by and see if the tree was still there. After our trip to the Oregon coast, we finally got the chance to go to Estacada, Oregon, we drove by the house again. As we were looking towards the tree, we saw that the tree was gone. There wasn't even any stump or dirt spots where it used to be. After that, for some time, I felt as if I was being watched. It's a crazy story, but my dad swears this to be true. Thank you for listening to another unsettling episode of Unexplained Encounters. You can send us your story to have it narrated on the show at darkstories.org. Unexplained Encounters is an EerieCast original series. You can find other horror-themed podcasts at EerieCast.com, such as Redwood Bureau, a fictional anthology series, Freaky Folklore, a documentary-style series about myths and cryptids around the world, Destination Terror, a show about the most haunted places, and Tales from the Break Room, 
another show I host all about the scary things that happen to people at work. Again, that's EerieCast.com. By the way, if you want fewer annoying ads and you want to support what we do, consider going to EerieCast.com plus to sign up for EerieCast Plus. That unlocks all our podcasts with all but host red ads removed. Until next time, stay safe out there and stay creepy because this world is a strange one.